The Bible warns about being puffed up with pride. But why? The answer next on The Prophetic Connection. My backdrop for this particular segment in episode four is the site, the traditional site of the Sermon on the Mount. Tradition says that somewhere behind me on the slopes, vast enough for a large crowd of people, Jesus gave that glorious sermon. And within the sermon, the eight Beatitudes, which begin with, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In the trees, which you can't see, the Church of the Beatitudes, built in 1938 and funded in part by Benito Mussolini, who was the Italian dictator at that time. And he, in fact, aligned himself with Adolf Hitler against the Allied armies. And of course, arrogance brought him low, and he was hanged by his own people uh, at the end of the war, toward the end of the war. Now, chapter four, it seems, was written by Nebuchadnezzar. It's all in the first person. And it's as if he wrote this himself or he dictated the details to someone else who wrote it for him. But the language is very much in the first person as if the king wrote all of chapter four. And of course, it's about a second dream that he had. And once again, he calls the astrologers, the wise men of Babylon to give him the interpretation. And once and again, they fail. However, there is someone in the kingdom who can interpret the dream. And so we read in Daniel 4, verse 8, But at last Daniel came before me. His name is Belteshazzar, the Babylonian name that he was given, according to the name of my God, um, Nebuchadnezzar's God. In him is the spirit of the holy God. And I told the dream before him, saying, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know the spirit of the holy God is in you, and no secret troubles you. Explain to me the visions of my dream that I have seen and its interpretation. And Daniel did exactly that, but it was not good news for King Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel chapter four describes a second disturbing dream that King Nebuchadnezzar experienced, but this was a dream that included a direct message from God about the king's immediate future. Nebuchadnezzar's second dream was a really disturbing dream. It was a dream of a great tree that had grown so great and the birds of the air and uh, so many creatures were taking shelter in it. Uh, obviously a very fruitful and, and a tree full of foliage. And, and, but but uh, in the vision that he saw, it's cut down and only the stump is left. And I believe that what was said to, said to the king was that this would be for seven seasons and it would be drenched with the dew of heaven. And, uh, and so when he told this dream to Daniel, uh, he was really asking this man who had already interpreted one of his dreams in a powerful way to give him a, a truthful interpretation of what this dream, this very disturbing dream meant. When asked to give an interpretation of the dream, the text says Daniel was astonished for a time and his thoughts troubled him. Clearly, this was a direct message from God to the king that Daniel was at first hesitant to explain. It was only when the king persisted that Daniel was willing to reveal the dream's shocking interpretation. This pattern of God intervening when a king who's in great power and great influence is not recognizing God, this pattern exists in other parts of the Bible. We see God show himself and show his his might and his greatness to Pharaoh of Egypt, and he doesn't respond positively. So this pattern of God raising up leadership and the leadership falling into pride and not recognizing God's own anointing upon them, generally the pattern is they fall into a judgment season of their life. But how did this prophetic dream apply to Nebuchadnezzar and the vast empire under his rule? So the trees cut down. In other words, his kingdom is cut down. And it's because he had been built up in pride. 
He saw himself as the king of kings. And God had to bring him down to size, cut him down to size, and he did. And for that seven year period, he lived like a maniac. I mean, he lost his mind. He's eating grass like a cow. He's separated from the rest of humankind. And then ultimately, when he's humbled, God can restore the kingdom to him. But why would God take the kingdom from the king and then restore him to power seven years later? It appears that at some point, Nebuchadnezzar recognizes that his favor and his anointing is from God. Uh, he seems to indicate at some point in this process who's in real control. And he says, it's the God of heaven, it's the, it's the God of Israel. He, he identifies the right king, and once he is willfully submitting himself to the Creator, the, the Creator in His mercy restores Nebuchadnezzar back to his, his place of prominence and extends his rulership a little bit longer so that we find the end of Nebuchadnezzar's rule is going to be one that is willing to broadcast the greatness of God, uh, er, different than his earlier rule where he was still not yet in a right relationship with the Lord Himself. It's clear that God used this second dream and its consequences to teach the king an important lesson about his sovereign power over the world he created. That is, only by the grace of God that kingdoms exist, and that God allows kings to rule over them. Don't go away. After this short break, Dr. John Tweedy returns with his teaching. Today in the Middle East, Israel stands alone as the only true democracy and free country in the region. Yet even free countries struggle with poverty and people in their society that fall through the cracks. This is especially true in Israel, as they are surrounded by enemies and must focus much of their budget on security. But you can make a difference. Your one-time donation of $20 or more can change a life. By giving today, you will help feed the elderly and Holocaust survivors, support those that live in areas of conflict, and help children in these areas go to school. We really wish to thank you for all your support in the past and say that it was very, very helpful for us. We see you as our partners and we wish that you continue uh, with your support of the Sterot children. When you call today with your one-time gift, as a thank you, you will receive the bi-monthly newspaper Israel and Christians Today and the special documentary Seven Amazing Prophecies Fulfilled. Call or write today. As we come to Nebuchadnezzar's second dream, it's clear that there are lessons that we can learn from God's dealings with the life of this man. Well, recognize that he was a mighty king and he conquered a vast empire. In fact, he was the instrument of that expansion. It was uh, Nebuchadnezzar who attacked Jerusalem more than once. And it was he who took Daniel and the pride of his really young people back to Babylon. So he has achieve incredible things in his single lifetime. But of course, those achievements um, allowed him to be arrogant and puffed up with pride and say, look what I've accomplished. And of course, that would be the first step in his downfall because the Bible is clear, pride precedes a fall. King Solomon was also a great achiever, but he was a man uh, to whom God gave supernatural wisdom. I mean, he had natural wisdom, but um, God gave him even greater wisdom because in a sense, he gave him an anointing, the wisdom that, can, that comes from heaven. And he wrote the book of Proverbs, some 3,000, well, I just explained them and say wise sayings, that if we paid attention to them, uh, life would certainly go better for us, especially where pride is concerned. But listen to what Solomon says, Proverbs 11, verse two, when pride comes, then comes shame, which is the same as saying pride precedes shame. Or in Proverbs 13, verse 10, by pride comes nothing but strife. And when we think we have all the answers to all the big questions of life, uh, more than anyone else around us, well, guess what? Um, that's also a slippery slope um, and we can, be, we can be brought low. Uh, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 29, 23, a man's pride will bring him low. And you see, this is exactly what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. 
king of Babylon, he experienced all of these consequences and more. His kingdom was stripped from him, but why and how? Well, that's the reason or the occasion for his second dream. Now, chapter four begins well enough, but it sort of goes downhill from there. Chapter four, verse one, and you know what? It seems that Nebuchadnezzar wrote this chapter, not Daniel, it seems to be written in the first person and scholars believe that these are Nebuchadnezzar's own words and somehow his letter or his record found its way into the book of Daniel. But listen to the text, verse one of, of Daniel four, Nebuchadnezzar the king to all peoples, nations and languages that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied to you. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the most high God has worked for me. Now that's a good statement because he's giving the God of all creation the honor and the glory. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. You know, that you'd have to say that's an expression that came from revelation, knowledge and understanding. How could he know that God's kingdom was an everlasting kingdom unless God somehow revealed it to him? So this is a great confessional statement that he is making, but he's making it to the kingdom, to all of his subjects. And then verse four, I, and every time we hear the word I, and we hear it again and again, it's always, it's sort of in the context of a prideful statements. So I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts on my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Now remember his first dream, uh, now this is his second, and uh, the first dream was of the great image with the various metals, and of course Daniel tells him that he's the head of gold that he saw in that dream of that first, uh, that image. And then he says in verse six, therefore I issued a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers came in, and I told them the dream. Now, this is different than the first time when he refused to tell them the dream's contents, but this time he's chosen to tell them. But they did not make known to me its interpretation. So even when he explains it to them, they can't interpret it. Now. They could have offered an interpretation, but I think this was their big fear. If they interpret the dream wrongly and Daniel interprets it rightly, they can be killed. So for some reason, they chose the path of honesty and simply said, we can't interpret it. But at last, Daniel came before me. His name is Belteshazzar. And of course, um, in chapter five, we'll come to Belshazzar, who is the, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar who assumes the throne, but it's easy to confuse the two. Daniel's given name in Babylon is Belteshazzar with the T-E in the middle of the name. But at last Daniel came before me. His name is Belteshazzar, which is the Babylonian name that Nebuchadnezzar gave him. And of course gave other Babylonian names to his three companions. According to the name of my God, in him is the spirit of the holy God, and I told the dream before him, saying, Belteshazzar, Daniel, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy God is in you, and no secret troubles you, explain to me the visions of my dream that I have seen, and its interpretations. These were the visions of my head while on my bed. Then he gives the description. So what he sees is a great tree in the midst of the the earth and its height was great. And I've chosen to stand here because behind me I have a, a tall tree with extended branches, so symbolic of the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. The tree grew and became strong. Its height reached to the heavens and it could be seen to the ends of all the earth. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and in it were, was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it. The birds of the heavens dwelt in its branches and all flesh was fed from it. I saw in the visions of my head while on my bed, and there was a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven. His way of explaining, presumably an angel. He cried aloud and said thus, chop down the tree and cut off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. 
Let the beast get out from under it and the birds from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump and roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let him graze with the beasts on the grass of the earth. And notice this, let his heart be changed from that of a man and let him be given the heart of a beast and let seven times pass over him. So this is what he dreams. And when we, we come to Daniel's interpretation, we realize it's, it's much more easy to understand the contents, which in fact are very specific. So he declares the dream to Daniel and asks Daniel to interpret. So then we read in verse 19, then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for a time and his thoughts troubled him. Why? Well, what he sees is that the kingdom is going to be stripped from King Nebuchadnezzar for a time at least, a period actually of seven years or the seven times that he understood in the dream. And it'll be restored to him. But how do you tell a great king um, that his kingdom is about to be stripped from him? So uh, what I think when it says Daniel was astonished, he was probably just looking for the proper words to express uh, the interpretation. I don't think he was afraid because there seemed to be no fear in Daniel. So the king spoke and said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its interpretation trouble you. In other words, don't hesitate. Give me the truth. Give it to me straight. And Belteshazzar answered and said, My Lord, may the dream concern those who hate you and its interpretation concern your enemies. Daniel wants to put the best foot in the dream, uh, best image on the dream. And so then he goes on and he begins to explain the tree that you saw, which grew and became strong, whose height reached to the heavens and which could be seen by all the earth, whose leaves were lovely and its fruit abundant, in which was food for all under which the beasts of the fees dwelt and in whose branches the birds of the heaven had their throne. It is you, O king, who have grown and become strong, for your greatness has grown and reaches to the heavens and your dominion to the end of the earth. And inasmuch as the king saw a watcher, a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave its stump and roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let him graze with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord, the king. They shall drive you from men. Your dwelling will be with the beasts of the field and they shall make you eat grass like oxen. They shall wet you with the dew of heaven and seven times shall pass over you till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. And inasmuch as they gave the command to leave the stump and roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you after you come to know that heaven rules. So Daniel, having given the king the interpretation, offers him some advice. Therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you Break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. In other words, perhaps God will give you a chance. If you change your ways immediately, maybe the dream will not be entirely fulfilled. That's how I read that. But watch what happens next. Verse 28, all this time, all this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of the 12 months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. The king spoke saying, is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? All those personal pronouns uh, about what he has achieved. He completely, see, he completely forgot, uh, it seems, the warning that came in the dream. And while Verse 31, while the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you. And immediately the kingdom was taken from him. And he suffered the consequences of his arrogance. And for seven years, he was bowed low to the earth, uh, eating grass. Uh, his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. So 
The king was taught an object lesson that lasted for seven years, but the story has a good ending. In verse 34, at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, my understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. So after seven long years, the king's reasoning returns to him. And he confesses again that God's kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and it is from generation to generation. And verse 35, and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing he does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? So the end of the story for um, King Nebuchadnezzar is a happy one. The kingdom restored and he says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. All of those works are truth and his ways justice and those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. And that's the great lesson we learn from chapter four of the book of Daniel. Now, are there warnings in the New Testament concerning pride? There certainly are, but more about those after this short break. For many years now, C4I Canada and our partners have been there for Israel, especially during times of war and hardship. Because of this support, Israel's most vulnerable have been cared for by groups like the Jaffa Institute and others. The Jaffa Institute is an institute that deals with children at high risk in slum communities around Israel. Each year, organizations like the Jaffa Institute care for those in Israel who are unable to care for themselves. And this is all possible because of people like you. We'd like to thank C4I and all the partners around the world for their support and love and blessing on the Jaffa Institute. With your monthly support of $20 or more, you are making a real difference in the lives of Israel's most needy. And when you become a monthly supporter, you will receive the bi-monthly newspaper, Israel and Christians Today. And while supplies last, the 13-part DVD set of the powerful series, Messiah. Call the number on your screen now and become a monthly partner today. Well, our focus for this episode, episode four, has been Daniel chapter four, and the fall from grace of King Nebuchadnezzar. There are also warnings in the New Testament about the dangers of pride, in fact, being puffed up with pride. The Apostle Paul, in his first letter to Timothy, who in fact was the young pastor who followed Paul at Ephesus, um, warned him. He was talking about leadership in the church. And so while this is a letter to Timothy, who was taking over leadership of that church in Paul's footsteps, it's really a warning to the church uh, down through history about who qualifies as a leader in the church. And so chapter 3 of 1 Timothy 1 begins like this. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. But then the qualifications for church leadership. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, nor not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous. One who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. And why? Well, Paul explains it. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Well, after this comes the warning about pride. Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. The parallel that's being given is, as the devil thought uh, more highly of himself than he ought to, he fell from grace in the kingdom of heaven. And so Paul draws that parallel and warns that we should not appoint someone to leadership in the church who lacks the experience, in fact, the credentials required for leadership for looking after the flock of God. And remember, where the church is concerned, it's spiritual warfare all the time. 
And so if you put someone in charge of the church of a congregation who's inexperienced, imagine the havoc that Satan can wreak in that particular congregation. Because we're fighting unseen battles in the spiritual realm. And we'll see more about that when we get to specifically Daniel chapter 10. But then the apostle John himself has something to say. And this is really the choice all Christians face. In the first letter of John, in chapter two, in verse 15, a choice. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and then this one, we're back to pride, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the Greek word that is used uh, for the pride of life in this sense is alas onia. Here's what it means. It means arrogant or boastful speech. And let me remind you of something that Nebuchadnezzar said. It's found in Daniel 4 in verse 30. And this comes after the vision that he had that Daniel interpreted for him. And in fact, in verse 28 of chapter 4, all this came upon Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of the 12 months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. The king spoke saying, is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? A completely prideful statement of all that he had accomplished would be the very thing that would bring him down because verse 31 of Daniel 4 puts it this way. The king spoke saying, is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? And notice the very next verse. While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you. A prideful statement the downfall of a king and his kingdom. In the next episode, we'll look at the full collapse of the kingdom of Babylon. Thanks for watching The Prophetic Connection and tune in next week for The Collapse of Babylon. Mayor Panim is one of the charities that Christians for Israel Canada supports. Providing food and care through soup kitchens throughout the land of Israel, Mayor Panim has become a critical source for the most vulnerable. Yet the needs in many communities like Demona are rising. With the recent closure of two other soup kitchens in Demona, Mayor Panim must now expand to care for more people who are in desperate need. The demand on us has increased by at least 30% over the last year. Thanks to C4I's assistance, we are now going to expand the center and expand the amount of meals which will be going out every day. That is a C4I project and we're very, very grateful. Your giving makes a difference in the lives of Israel's most needy. Please help C4I, help Mir Panim, help people in Dimona. Call or write today and partner with us with a gift of just $20 or more and show the people of Israel that you care. We're waiting to hear from you.